Thank you for inviting me, Kim, um, and Lisa, and my friends here at Skink. I've been here a few times, and I always love being here. Um, and I love being in Atlanta, because I am a northerner. And the southerners know hospitality better than anyone. I actually lived in Dallas, and Austin, and um, Virginia, and where else? Louisville, Kentucky. So I actually can say it right instead of Louisville. Um, so I know I know Southern hospitality, and I love I love this part of the country, um, and I love the work that I do. So I'm very excited to be able to talk about that this evening, and I'm going to jump right in. Uh, topic is oral language, and it's something I feel very passionately about. The only problem is there's a bunch of SLPs in the audience tonight. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're an SLP. Look at that. Like a third of you here are <laughs> SLPs. Um, raise your hand if you are an educator in the audience tonight. It's sitting as, a, okay, so almost all of you are educators. Raise your hand if you're just a parent, meaning, uh, thank you, Tina. Um, and I, sa I, I said to Tina, right? I said, Tina, you're not just a parent. She didn't say she's just a parent. But a lot of parents say that, and um, I think parents have made a huge difference in this field, and I applaud the efforts of Decoding Dyslexia and other grassroots groups that have raised the public's attention to a huge crisis that we have in this country, um, huge crisis. So oral language is at the core and the heart of reading and writing proficiency. That's the topic of my talk this evening. So I'm preaching to the choir. Um, and I know that I was hoping I had more parents here because really this message is a, is a message that I want parents to really take to heart. But also I think, I hope that you as teachers and SLPs take something away from, from what I have to say. Um, so here are my talking points. Again, to oral language is at the core, but I'll explain why I chose the word at the heart as well and a little bit about structured literacy and its connection to language, and the last is what I ideally would like reading and writing to look and sound like in classrooms. I spend a lot of my time in classrooms. I should, let me go back here. Oh, I'm, I missed another slide, but that's okay. It was really a slide talking a little bit about literacy how, but Bill gave a decent introduction, so I don't have to say very much other than the fact that I've been working in schools now for 24 years. Um, before that, I worked in mostly in public schools as a special education teacher, um, working with kids with dyslexia. And then I shifted gears um, and chose to work with teachers because my husband convinced me I'd have a greater impact on having more children learn to read if I worked with teachers, and I've actually really enjoyed it. Um, now I have a team of 10 people. We call ourselves mentors, but we basically coach teachers in their classrooms um, because this, as you all know well, this body of knowledge that we're now calling the science of reading is vast, and it would, takes years as a, as a teacher to understand it and put it into practice. So to think that we could do a professional development workshop or two or three and get the job done is pretty crazy. So I know firsthand, and you all do too, how important it is to show teachers what this looks like and to really you know, work with them on a weekly basis. That's what our mentors do, work for at least a year, maybe two years getting into teachers' classrooms every single week and working with them and showing what, um, what it looks like. So I'm gonna go through some of these slides quickly because a lot of you know these, but for those of you who don't have this background knowledge, we talk about the fact that language is receptive and expressive and show the relationships between listening and reading, which are receptive, and speaking and writing, which are expressive, but they're all right inter, interwoven and, and linked. What is oral language? It's this process of speaking and listening, of course, and it's all about communicating. Um, children learn language through interactions, right? Interactions with anyone that's in their path, basically. A caregiver, a parent, peers, siblings, etc. Um, and it has to be learned in meaningful contexts. And here I just talked about this. 
And how many of you have seen Pamela Snow's slide on oral language competence? So I, I really like this. I love, I love graphics that take a complex idea and break it down. And I really like this graphic. And the next slide, oh boy. I'm gonna have to stay tethered here. The next um, slide just breaks down the elements of the language house. And I will obviously make these slides available. But you can see that the house itself is a nice metaphor for all the things that really combine to ensure that children become competent with oral language, beginning with a solid ground in social emotional context, early language experiences, et cetera. And so tonight, I really can't do justice to all the elements. So I'm gonna specifically focus on talking a little bit about those strong foundations in the early years and talking more about the reading, writing, and spelling environmental wall, as it's called. Um, this is a QR code if you want to just get a uh, link to literacyhow.org, but that's our URL. And um, we do webinars for, um, for large audiences because they're virtual, so you can get into some of those webinars and see some of our content. We took the five core com comprehensive component, or five competencies, I can't talk tonight, five pillars, as they're referred to often, of the, from the National Reading Panel and put them around the reading wheel. But we kind of added some things along the way. We added spelling because spelling is really important and we don't do a good job of teaching spelling. Um, and that's important because we're thinking about going from speech to print and oral language is we're going to talk about the foundation of learning to read. So you think about going from the known, the words children have been immersed in from birth, and then encoding them before they're expected to actually decode them. Um, so that's why spelling is called out explicitly here. Morphology was not mentioned by the National Reading Panel, but morphology, because English is morphophonemic, we really want to... Um, ensure that children understand those morphological elements um, that go along in vocabulary as well as in phonics. Um, fluency used to be here because fluency was one of the five big ideas, but we found that teachers were asking kids to read fast and they were losing sight of the purpose of reading, right? Purpose of reading is to make meaning and you have to read fast enough so that you can start to think about grouping those words and reading prosodically. But we felt like we could get more bang for our buck um, and get twofer, a twofer, build fluency and teach syntax skills explicitly. So we replace syntax, uh, replace fluency with syntax. Um, and then up in the left-hand segment, we have comprehension. The re National Reading Panel never talked about writing. And from my way of thinking, oral language and writing are the two most neglected skills in public school classrooms right now. Very little focus on oral language and there's very little explicit instruction in writing. So I don't have time to talk about both, uh, but I am gonna talk about writing here at Skink um, on Thursday, which I'm excited about. So those two are reciprocal, text comprehension and writing, so we put those in the same section of the wheel, reading wheel. But what I really want to focus on um, is where does oral language fit into that equation and why do we say it's at the core? How many of you have heard of Patricia Kuehl's work? So I'm glad not all of you have because I love her work. Um, she's been doing her work for probably almost as long as I have. Um, she has a lab at the University of Washington and she studies um, babies and um, their brains and how they acquire language and um, has done some really great experiments and she's got some great YouTube videos. This one is pretty short, but it gets her message across, I think, really well. Well, that brings us to current research on learning, an area in which the University of Washington's iLabs is a leader. The Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences is a multi-million dollar research lab that's cracking the code on how our brains work. 
Josephine is with one of the co-directors, Dr. Patricia Kuhl. Dr. Kuhl, welcome to the program. Thank you. You are considered a foremost authority on how we learn language and especially how early babies learn it. Is it true that when babies are just a few months old, they're able to hear every sound of all languages? They can. I like to call them citizens of the world because they do something that we can't do. They hear all these distinctions and you and I are limited to those that are used in our native languages. And Maybe how they learn it is the way we speak to them. And, and I know that, you know, whenever you hear mothers and fathers speak to their kids, there is a very distinctive speech pattern. There's this sort of sing song, hello, baby. <laughs> why, do we, why do we do that? Uh, we do it probably unconsciously. Yeah. Uh, we know intuitively that children are not able to hear complex sentences. And so what we do is simplify the language and make it very interesting to listen to. So we increase the pitch and we speak more slowly and we have very exaggerated intonation contours. So that is conditioning to, to the language of whatever culture they're in. It, it uh, increases their attention to what we're saying and how we're saying it. It's both emotionally satisfying and it has linguistic information that's simpler for their brains to process. Is it also true, your research suggests, that babies are actually much better than grown-ups at learning a la another language, a new language? Yes, biologists call this a critical period and language is one of the best examples that we have. From zero to seven, children are phenomenal at their abilities to simply absorb uh, information about a language by listening to it. And as you move towards puberty, that completely changes. After puberty, it's much, much more difficult. Well, no wonder I have such a hard time learning Spanish or French. Yes, that's true. And what babies are doing, one of the reasons it's so interesting to study them is we'll learn some of the magic that they're applying to that language learning information early. And maybe we can do something to help adults learn later in life. Well, if there's that window of opportunity, does that mean that at some point that window is going to slam shut? It definitely narrows. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but it narrows. If you think of the physiology of the brain, that synapses in the first three years of life are growing in a huge and fast and rapid way. Synapses being the synapses connections are the connections between, between, the between neurons, cells, yeah. and that's the way information is communicated. And so, at the age of three, children have three times the synapses that we have as adults. Hmm. As they move from babyhood to the teenage years, when Another major revolution is going on. They prune synapses as we prune rose bushes to make the remaining connections more strong. They are pruning synapses that have not been used. So they actually have more synapses than grown-ups, three Absolutely. times as many. That's Just why the opposite of what we think. <laughs> the three-year-old is ready for the world, all possibilities, and yet to focus on particular, to develop expertise in any one language or area. Just as you take a plant and you prune it, you want that plant to develop strength in the remaining connections. And so the brain is really undergoing major revolution. Now some parents might think, well, maybe I should just stick my babies in front of a video, have them learn Chinese or Spanish from from the time they're really, really young. Does that work? Well, there again, the experiments give us the answer. We've done experiments where uh, babies at nine months are exposed to Mandarin or Spanish. Bueno, vamos a ver qué tenemos. And a live situation, very natural, playing on the floor and talking about books and toys. We see that in live situations, they learn so much in that early period, they can match the uh, skills of children growing up in the foreign country who have listened for months to that language. But if you show that same information over a videotape or over an audio tape, our studies are showing there is no learning whatsoever. Really? People need people to learn, at least when they're young. That's interesting. Why is that? Well, we think the brain's uh, circuitry may be turned on by social interaction. If you think of the baby brain as a computer, that it, it's a computationally amazing device, the brain, the human brain. However, that brain isn't just an automaton. It's not just taking computational information randomly all the time. Human beings tell it, in a sense, implicitly, when to turn the learning machinery on. I just love that video. I could never see it enough. There's so many important messages that um, Patricia Cool and her team have taught us about the uh, development of the brain and how language is learned and the fact that um, babies don't learn language from an audio tape or from a, a, from a, from a TV screen. And yet, how many of us have seen uh, parents or caregivers putting a, a phone in front of a baby to entertain them. Um, it's, it's something I feel very strongly that we have to, uh, we have to educate uh, people about. Well, that brings up. Okay, so um, 
So how do we learn spoken language? Well, as you know, we listen to sounds, we listen to speech, and it's a continuous stream of sounds separated by pauses. And infants listen very closely to speech that they hear, but they're looking at the mouth of the person speaking, and they're syncing what they're seeing with what they're hearing. And, um, and they're noticing and recording these patterns of speech that Dr. Cool talked about. And they, in, and they in, are able to do that, and they eventually learn how to parse it to figure out the word boundaries and understand that these parsed units have meaning. And so the spoken language is obviously very important foundational core to learning to read and write, because as the child is hearing these meaningful words like mama, and they're hearing them over and over, they start to categorize them. They start to put them in little file folders. They have folders for daddy, for Fido the dog, when they're going to bed, what the nighttime rituals and routines are. And they file them and they have a mental representation for each of those words that they hear over and over. And connecting the sound to the mental representation is um, something that supports the connection between what they're hearing and the meaning of those words. And the it's a two-way street, right? So you're going from spoken language to what you're hearing to those mental images, and those mental representations are what help you figure out what to say to express um, in language. Now, as we said, and as um, we all know, we're wired for speech, for language, but we're not wired for reading. We have to use the hemisphere, the left hemisphere, and those areas of the brain that are there for language acquisition to develop reading skills. And this is the reading brain that most of you have seen. This is the one that's most commonly used now from Stan Stanislaus to Hain. And really showing the areas of the brain, again, that are there for language acquisition and how they're, they're really connected. And I think it's the connectivity, the connections between those areas that I really like to focus on. Again, showing how the network and building the network is what creates um, skilled reading. Um, I, I'll be talking about a lot of different things, and some of this is familiar with to you, but some of it may be less familiar or maybe a resource that you're not familiar with. I'm sure many of you know about the International Dyslexia Associ Association. Their fact sheets are excellent. I like the fact sheets for parents um, to give them a really nice, concise explanation of a complex concept. This is one of my favorites that talks about oral language and dyslexia. I have a lot of respect for these two experts, Hugh Katz and Elsa Cardenas Hagen, both are speech and language pathologists um, who have studied, and, and PhDs who have studied reading and various aspects of reading. But this really talks about, again, the central role that language plays in learning to read. And for me, parents understanding how important that language is and seeing the warning signs, seeing the risk factors that kids present with at an early age, in this case, a history of dyslexia, late talking, and other aspects of um, challenges associated with language. Most of you are familiar with Hollis Scarborough's rope. Um, has anyone here not seen it? Probably, okay, so you all know the rope. What I really wanna focus on for the next, um, really, what time is it? Almost seven, um, for, the, for the next 15 or 20 minutes is the top of the rope. So we know that our kids with dyslexia often have difficulties, if not always, have difficulties with word recognition skills. So we know phonology and phonological processing is important. But I also know, because dyslexia is a language-based learning disabilities, disability, that these students also struggle with aspects of language comprehension. And um, so as children are transitioning to school and learning to read and write, we have to think about what are we going to do to address those areas of the brain, um, or sorry, those areas of learning. So one thing I wanted to talk about is how important it is to read to children. So this particular, and actually 
there is a video here. But We're entering an exciting new era where we know more than we ever have about how something so simple as reading aloud for 15 minutes by a loving parent to a child can change their brain for a lifetime. I'm Dr. John Hutton, a pediatrician and clinical research fellow at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Reading and Literacy Discovery Center. I'm fortunate to be able to bring my background as a child who was read to, a parent who read to my own children, a children's bookstore owner, an author of children's books, and a pediatrician to inform my work as a brain imaging researcher here to better understand how early reading environment and exposure to books can change the brain during the critical stages of development prior to kindergarten. A lot of families um, don't have as much access to books or readers or that model of reading together and it's become very important to me to be an advocate for such families to try to work to better understand how reading influences healthy development and how it makes such a big difference in um, not only getting ready for school but just being um, healthy and ready for success in life. In the first five years, when brain development is proceeding at a very rapid pace, babies are born with approximately 100 billion neurons, which is about the most they'll ever have. And from there, their brains develop incredibly rapidly, um, doubling in size by about one year old, and then reaching about 85 to 90 percent of, of adult size by the time they're four to five years old. Reading is not a natural process that, that kids are born to know how to do. In order to learn to read effectively, um, different older aspects of, of the brain that are more hardwired are brought together. Most importantly, those are, are vision, which is sort of seeing what's on the page and turning the pages, imagination, which is seeing in the mind's eye what's going on and is related to the visual networks, and then language, which is starting with, with hearing words and then eventually babbling and cooing and, and learning to say words independently. Those visual and language networks are then brought together to allow a child to see a word on a page, turn it into language in their mind, and then imagine what's going on and make sense of it. Have any of you heard of uh, Read Aloud 15 Minutes? Well, it was new to me, too. Um, I heard a wonderful um, podcast with Marianne Wolf um, on the Ezra Klein show a couple months ago, and she mentioned the Goldilocks study, which is really interesting, a study that John Hutton did. Um, about reading to children digitally and in print. Um, and also, you, a lot of uh, teachers use smart boards and do read alouds with their smart boards and think that's an engaging way for children to, to hear a book. And actually, his studies show that the children did better when the, re when the book was read aloud by a real person. Not surprising to us, but it's really important that we have this research that we share with, with teachers, and in this case, with parents. It's the human interaction that we have when we read to children, as Dr. Hutton talked about. It's the connection, the social-emotional um, skills that, as he says, last a lifetime. So if there were lots of parents in the room, I would spend a little more time on this slide really talking about what we would want to see parents doing at home with their children to promote oral language and how important it is that parents are talking to their children, having conversations with their children, wherever they are, whatever they're doing, with babies narrating. Um, everything they're doing because, of course, the babies are not going to be having expressive language to use, but they are taking everything in and paying attention to everything they're hearing. So language, language, language is really important. Um, when we first started our work in the year 2000, we spent a lot of time talking to teachers about the important um, the impact that the classroom has as a learning environment and really thinking about what those the classroom environment should look like and sound like. And it was um, really amazing to me as I spent time in gen ed classrooms because I'd spent my first 25 years of my career in special ed resource rooms, kind of isolated from the gen ed classrooms, how principals were looking for quiet classrooms when they would walk the halls. And they felt that that was the mark of a good teacher, a teacher who had control of the class, who managed the class well, and you heard the teacher's voice almost all the time versus listening to children having conversations. So I'm going to show you a video in a minute that really is the antithesis of the quiet classroom and why that's so important. 
Um, we also talked to our teachers about decontextualized language. That was a word I hadn't heard, um, but now I've grown to understand it and appreciate how important it is that teachers understand the role that rich read-alouds play and interactive read-alouds play with young children who aren't able to read those rich um, texts because they you know, don't have the reading skills to do so. So teachers really, the onus is on them to read to their students many times a day to help with this language of the classroom, this academic language. And as I said, if you think about the top of Hollis Scarborough's rope and thinking about these strands, interactive read-alouds really can address every single one of them in really substantive ways, thinking really intentionally about what background knowledge you want to build around topics and themes, thinking about intentional vocabulary instruction, you know, choosing wisely five or six words from the read aloud that you're going to carry throughout the day, throughout the week, um, and make sure those words actually get, you know, back, get in the child's lexicon so they can use them expressively. Um, syntax, you know, speaking in complete sentences, making sure kids answer in complete sentences when you ask them um, these inferential questions and just building their experience with a broad range of genres and, and um, discourse styles. The other thing I've grown to appreciate and I think is extremely important is thinking about our read alouds and bringing diversity, cultural diversity into the classroom. And um, I like this video um, talking about, and many of you have heard this, but in case you haven't, I like this video talking about mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. We need diverse books because we need books in which children can find themselves, see reflections of themselves. I wrote a piece, uh, maybe 1990 it was published, uh, which I called Mirrors, Windows, and Sliding Glass Doors. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's really why we, we um, children need to see themselves reflected, but books can also be windows, um, and, and so you can, you can look through uh, and see other worlds and see how they match up or don't match up to your own. But the sliding glass door allows you to enter that world as well. And so it, that's the reason that, that d the diversity needs to go both ways. I mean, it's not just children uh, who have been underrepresented and marginalized who need these books. It's also the children uh, who always find their mirrors in the books and therefore get an exaggerated sense of their own self-worth and a false sense of what the world is like because it's, it's uh, becoming more and more colorful <laughs> and diverse uh, as, as time goes on. Um, so I think that's why. I love that. And so I'm really, I've been really working with my team to find books that um, do, you know, the things that, that we know are so important to acknowledge are just increasingly more diverse. Um, linguistically, culturally, and otherwise in our classrooms. You Tina. I don't. Okay. It's a project of College Wonderful. Nice. I've heard about it for years now. There's a website, and they books up to about Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for, so diversebookfinder.org. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, Dina. Appreciate that. Any, and we learn from each other, right? There's so many wonderful resources out there, can't get enough time to explore all of them. But yeah, makes our lives easier when we find them, right? So I want to talk a little bit about how, again, how books and these rich books, these varying types of books really um, help with our language development in terms of thinking. And this is a famous quote 
by Lev Vygotsky. Uh, giving our students practice talking with others gives them frames for thinking on their own. So it's not just the reading of the books, it's talking about the books and stopping and having conversations about the ideas in the books. And um, I talked a little bit about Marianne earlier, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about her as I continue to go through this, this talk. Um, but most of you know Marianne is, is very much interested in discussing with teachers and parents what the deep reading brain is and what that means. And her, and her book, Reader Come Home, which I highly recommend, and these wonderful pictures throughout the book depicting the brain and its complexity and all the things that it's wired to do, um, is this idea of insight and novel thought. And this was the podcast I listened to, and I love this, this podcast, The Ezra Klein Show, which is an interesting series. And Ezra interviewed Marianne, and I loved her talking about the reading sanctuary, that innermost landscape that is where we go when we read our best. And that's what reading gives us. It gives us our best thoughts, but it also is one of the best forms of communicating with other, others' best thoughts. And um, it's communicative and it's solitary at the same time, which you know is sort of interesting when you think about that. Um, so Marianne is profound thinker, is a very deep thinker, and um, in Reader Come Home, she really talks about the concern she has, and probably many of you do too, that our children are not reading. And the only way you improve your reading is to read. The only way you get to experience this is to read different, different uh, types of books, different perspectives, et cetera. And through um, this deep reading, you develop critical thought and empathy. Um, so the empathy is what I want to talk a little bit about. It's, it's where the heart of language comes in. So oral language at the core, but oral language at the heart. Um, and thinking about the different perspectives we want children to be exposed to and talk about and understand. So a number of years ago when I um, was working at Haskins Labs, we got a research grant from the Institute of Education Sciences. And we could find great researchers who were doing good work in phonemic awareness and doing great work in phonics and doing some work in vocabulary. And, and um, so the, the sections of the reading wheel you saw earlier. But we really were trying to figure out a practical approach to teaching comprehension that teachers could relate to. And we studied um, and we found out about Mary Ellen Morrow, who some of you know, and. Um, when I share my slide deck with you, I'll have a link to her work, which is um, Story Grammar Marker. So SLPs tend to know Mary Ellen Morrow's work, right? Um, but for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's really a way to teach children about story structure. And most teachers know problem, character setting problem solution. A lot of um, teachers, a lot of teachers teach beginning, middle, and end. And interestingly enough, Mary Ellen Morrow was working with some very um, severely um, language-impaired children. And this one little boy came to her clinic one afternoon and started to cry. And she said, what's wrong? And he said, I don't know what to do with my boxes. And she said, oh, what, what do you mean your boxes? And he pulled out this crumpled piece of paper that he had for homework. And the boxes were, had a B, an M, and an E. And she said, B, M, and E, what's that? And he said, beginning, middle, and end. And she said, well, what does that mean? And he said, I have to, I have to tell a story. You know, we listen to a story in class, and my homework is to write what happened at the beginning of the story, in the middle of the story, and at the end of the story. But I don't know how to do that. And she thought about it, and she's like, my gosh, how would a child know what to do? Like, how do you know what's... what's at the beginning, et cetera, et cetera. So she came up with this um, called Story Grammar, some of you know, and found an icon that represented the different parts of the story. The character is one icon, the setting is another. Initiating event or problem is a, is a shoe or a cleat. Um, so the cleat or the sh you know, the, the cleat kicks off the game, so starts the story going. 
um, reaction, feeling, plan, etc. cetera. So um, this narrative story map was more complete, certainly went well beyond BME, but it went even further than character setting problem solution because in that story structure, there's no thinking about heart feelings, right? And again, in this wonderful podcast that Marianne um, did with Ezra Klein, she said, let's not forget the heart as we battle what is best for the mind because the heart, the affective aspect of reading is one of the most beautiful things that leads to that inner sanctuary that she talked about. Um, and so I immediately, when I heard that, I said, well, this is what I love about this story, Grammar Marker, because when we started to use it to help kids understand stories, you know, and we started with narrative, because narrative is the easiest place to start with, with structure, right? You've got one story structure as opposed to how many for expository text. And so, but Mary Ellen Morrow talks about this critical thinking triangle where you're really connecting the problem with the character's feelings and the plan that they make. This is the hand, the plan that I'm going to use to solve the problem. And in so doing, you talk about feelings, you also talk about mental state verbs. Like now you're trying to have some insight into the character's feelings, into the character's character, right? Perspective. Why did they think the way they did? Why did they feel the way they did? Why was it a problem for this character, etc.? And also these linguistic verbs that authors use versus said, they whispered or they gasp, which also give insight into the character's emotions, thoughts, and feelings. So we spend a lot of time with children talking about feelings and we um, really do that so that we can help them get inside the character's heads and start to think and take the perspective of the character. Um, I have a really cute video, but when I played it earlier, it wasn't loud enough. So I do have um, on one of the slides a QR code that you can see. We do have our own Literacy How YouTube channel and lots of classroom videos there that you can see. But you can see that we're also thinking about shades of meaning when we talk about these feelings. We're developing vocabulary that use robust vocabulary words around feelings. And um, again, getting kids excited to talk and share. Um, another video I'd like to share with you is one on oracy. Oracy is defined as the ability to express oneself coherently, communicate freely. And I love this video, it's Edutopia that really um, describes what oral language looks like in these classrooms where they've really learned how, teachers have learned how to facilitate conversations and the children have learned how to interact with one another in substantive ways talking about what they're learning. And really you can see how engaged they are in learning all the way around. So let's Put your hand up if someone in your family comes from somewhere else in the world and has come to live in London. Could you turn to the person next to you and have a discussion about this talking point? I think Stratford is a better place to live because they're not against anyone and it's... Well, can I just clarify you? What do you mean by like against? Like what we see is the keystone to everything that happens in the curriculum. And there are such high expectations for talk and it does really make a difference in a children how articulate and how confident they are. The vision of School 21 is to prepare young people for the world that they're going to go into in the 21st century. I think one of the biggest barriers to the students we serve really getting on in life is lack of good communication skills. We need to elevate speaking to the same level as reading and writing. So we have a vote. What makes me enjoy talking the most is that everybody's listened to you and you're like part of the world and you feel respected and important. When I'm talking, they're listening um, and what I'm saying and sometimes they give me questions or then maybe I give them questions. Every child within this school is expected to speak in every lesson, in every opportunity throughout their school day. And we try and create lots of different contexts for young people to hone their skills as speakers. 
So what I want us to do now is to have a discussion about different kinds of culture. And I want us to discuss this. Some cultures are better than others. I think every teacher, if you say to them, do you talk in your classroom? Of course there's talking in the classroom, but what's different here is the deliberateness of it. Every teacher needs to have that toolkit of things that they can draw on to bring effective talk into their practice. We've done a lot of work introducing sentence stems that children can use for different situations, so for agreeing with somebody, for um, disagreeing politely with someone, for challenging someone. And while we're doing that, I want you to make sure that you're using some of the sentence stems. So you might say linking to someone's point or build on something that somebody has said. Building on the... I agree because maybe... The thing that's had the biggest impact on my practice is probably discussion guidelines. We are going to be discussing why beliefs were important or why they weren't important in ancient Greece. Could anybody remind me about any of our discussion guidelines? One of them is when someone's not contributing, you have to invite them by asking them a question or saying their name. Excellent. Why would you do that, Aaron? Then uh, everyone has an idea. Everyone gets to share their idea, don't they? Well done. So discussion guidelines were created in conjunction with the children. These are the five or six key things that we think make a really good discussion. I've been able to take a step back and I think that the children take on a larger role within the classroom. I think it should be Aries and Athena because they're both the god of war. Yeah, but to challenge your diva, there are lots of fish. And so another key way of promoting oracy in the classroom is to think carefully about the groupings that you use. So whether you're getting them to talk in pairs or in trios or in larger groups. Sometimes it's best to have students in threes. Sometimes we look at how they can stand in the traverse opposite each other. Each of those different groupings enables a different type of conversation. If you see inside them, we're all human beings and we're all people. Our oracy programme is comprehensive. It has to be seen in maths and science and, and those subjects that traditionally haven't had a talk focus. I'm going to stop there because I want to just move on because it's getting close to the end of the hour. Um, so let me go back to my PowerPoint. So on this particular framework, you can see for student presentations, um, there's, they're looking at their physical their cognitive, their linguistic, and emotional aspects of oral language, which I think is a really nice way of parsing out um, those different aspects of communication. Um, the discussion guidelines that were talked about, I thought were also really important because um, the kids really do abide by those rules of the classroom. I also loved um, this is, comes from an article that I put in the, in the reference section from an article that Fisher, Frey, and Rothenberg wrote together talking about the importance of talking in the classroom and the types of purposeful student talk that should happen throughout the day and also the types of talk in terms of the roles that children play. So they all have an opportunity to take on these various roles, um, which is wonderful way of engaging kids in becoming more of the lead in these discussion groups. So teachers really can um, make learning engaging, fun, interactive, focused on oral language. Um, providing think time is very important, especially for children who have slow processing speed, which many of the students in our um, Skank School and other schools for children with learning disabilities have slow processing, but we really want to find ways to engage all of them. We also have to think about teaching listening um, because that's not something kids are doing very well because they're on their devices a lot. And I find even children who don't aren't labeled with having pragmatic difficulties. Um, I think all our kids have trouble with pragmatics because of their use of technology now. So um, just thinking about teaching the listening skills that are also important. And as I said, this breakdown of thinking about the physical, the cognitive, the linguistic, and the social emotional. This is an excellent book um, that really goes very deep into this oracy framework. Uh, so I highly recommend it. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to really 
skip these slides on structured literacy because I think you all have a pretty strong background in this. But this slide is busy, I know, but it's looking at the structure of language and where does each of those structures live um, on the reading wheel in terms of its connection to a reading and writing um, skill that I talked about earlier. So really language, as we said, is the foundation of literacy. Academic language is what we're talking about here, ensuring that children are good with it at an oral level so that they can read it, write it proficiently. Um, reading and writing float on a sea of talk, which I just love, love that quote. So what should teachers do? We need teachers to be good role models, thinking aloud, being intentional. These are some of the ways that you can be intentional. Of course, as Bill pointed out, I love syntax, I love sentences. That's the place you start, is making sure children can produce sentences of different length and variety uh, so they can get it into their writing. And um, this is just a cool, um, Caitlin Dillon, who was one of my mentors for several years, came up with this beautiful um, picture of the connections between listening, decoding, speaking, encoding, reading, and writing. And she did this, and then in her genius, she turned this on its side and showed how that kind of fits on the, the brain. And all that to say that when we teach these oral language skills, when we teach read to reading and writing proficiency, we really do change kids' brains. Um, and isn't that the best thing in the world? When we get the child's brain to wire, to have all the activation in the left hemisphere that we're looking for, that is the signature of a skilled reader, um, that's what we all live to do. Um, here are my references and some of the resources I mentioned this evening. I said that I would stop at 7.25. I'm a couple minutes late, but um, I thank you very much for staying with me, and I'm happy to take any questions um, that we have.